All right, we're going to go ahead now and get started in Galatians chapter 4 as we keep going through our video commentary. We're actually going to start back in Galatians 3.23, even though this is titled Galatians 4. We're going to, we didn't get to cover in the last session all of Galatians chapter 3, which was too much to get to. So we're going to start with Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. And um, so I want you to just, you know, if you have your Bibles, turn there. But uh, I have been incredibly blessed by doing this. I mean, it has just been so rich and deep and man my heart has been rejuvenated and just like wow I, I felt like I just getting in here and digging into scripture I, I have learned so much as I've just dug into scripture just want to encourage you to keep digging in and there's so much I learned I feel like over this last few weeks as I have been teaching this so just Anyway, it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing. And, and just hopefully God's word spreads out from here into the nations. But starting in Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, Paul's writing, and he says, But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Now, in, in Galatians 3, 23, all the way to 4, 7, if you don't understand biblical adoption in the first century, Greco-Roman adoption in the first century, and how that worked, which, by the way, was vastly different than, for, than 21st century adoption we're used to, then a lot of what Paul is talking about, you don't really understand the depth and the meaning of what he means. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through just really quick, give you a brief overview of Greco-Roman adoption in the first century, because it really is so different than adoption is today. And I go into great detail about this in my book, The Eternal Blueprint. I spent an entire chapter basically going through adoption in the first century. I mean, it, when, I, when I really understood that, my eyes were opened because if we don't understand the historical context an author was writing into biblically, then we really can't grasp all that God is trying to say through the Holy Spirit, through that writer, if we don't set ourselves back in the first century. And so Paul is writing uh, about that. And so just to give you a very brief description of Greco-Roman adoption in the first century, it basically had three phases. The first phase was placement into the family. And, and actually, let me take a step back and say this. Adoption in the first century was not so much about giving parents a child and a child of parents. It was much more related to giving a father who didn't have an heir, giving that father someone to pass down his inheritance to so the son, and that son would be a mature son, not a child, but a mature son, would be able to handle the inheritance. And so a lot of times adoption, in fact, this is what it means in the Greek, it means son placement. The, the idea was that a mature son was placed into or over a father's inheritance having the character and the uh, ability to be able to steward that inheritance so the inheritance would not be squandered. And you're familiar with the parable of the, the, um, the prodigal son. And he took the inheritance and he went and he squandered his father's inheritance. Basically, the idea behind first century adoption was to make sure that a, that a son who was going to inherit was mature enough and had the character so that he would not squander the father's well-earned, you know, just over his entire life, all the blood, sweat, and tears that has come to uh, have this money and this wealth so it would not be squandered by foolishness. It would not be squandered by living that was just, just foolish. And so, uh, so anyway, that's kind of the, the idea uh, of Greco-Roman adoption in the first century. It was more about an inheritance than it was about having some, a new family member. So, that was, the, that was the, the idea there. And so the first phase of Greco-Roman adoption was placement into the family. If an, if an heir did not have a son, an adult son, that he could bring 
or that he could pass on his inheritance to, the family would bring an adult son or a child into their family from the outside into their family and then and then bring to, brought us to the second phase, preparation for the inheritance. The, the heir, the one who was designated to be heir, uh, whether natural born or outside the family, would then be placed under a child trainer. And uh, this is what Paul's alluding to here in Galatians, is he's placed under a child trainer, and that child trainer would groom that child, usually very immature at the time, would groom that child to prepare him, to get the foolishness out, to get wisdom into him, to get him prepared character-wise so the child would be able to handle and steward the father's inheritance. And so, you know, that time period, there was really no set time period. It was all based upon the maturity of the child and how, whether or not the father felt like the child is now ready for placement into the inheritance. The third phase is placement into the inheritance. And, and as I mentioned before, the Greek word adopted as sons is one Greek word that means son placement. And so it's placing a mature son over the inheritance. And so when the, when the heir was fully trained and prepared, the father would then place him as the legal heir of the inheritance, giving him the full rights of sonship. And so that's the background that Paul's speaking into in Galatians, at the end of Galatians 3 and the beginning of Galatians 4. And if we don't have that understanding, if we don't have that first century paradigm of thinking, that perspective of thinking, then when we read it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us. And I know I read this for so many years just going, what is he even talking about? Why is the law called a tutor? What, what does it mean to be kept in custody? What does all that even mean? And until I understood Greco-Roman adoption in the first century, it made no sense to me. But once I understood it, I, uh, I realized, oh, wow, Paul is wanting to, Paul is teaching something I had no frame of reference for. And now that I have it, now I see what he's saying. And now I understand what he's saying. And so that's the idea here. So Paul says, he uses phrases such as kept in custody under the law. The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, our child trainer. That, that's really the idea, that we are no longer under a tutor. Those all described the, the law being a child trainer to lead us to Jesus Christ. And, that, and that's what Paul's getting at here. So the question is, how was the law a child trainer? How was the law a, our child trainer? Well, the law, and if you read a lot of Paul's writings, the law you know, he said in Romans chapter 7, is the law sinful? No, the law is not sinful. The law points out and defines what sin is. The law shows us our utter depravity. The law shows us, all, 16, uh, all 613 commandments show us that we have no ability in and of ourselves to keep the commandments of God, the external commandments of God, in and of our own selves, both externally and internally. In other words, we realize the law shows us we are utterly depraved and corrupt, that apart from a Savior, apart from a Messiah, apart from Jesus Christ, there's no way we could ever be in right standing with God. So the law has served as our child trainer to lead us to justification by faith, to realize that no one of us, no person, whether Jew or Gentile, none of us can ever be right with God through law-keeping. None of us can ever be right with God by strict obedience to the law uh, because it's impossible. So the law was a child trainer. The law was taking us and grooming us and preparing us and helping us not to become a pagan and not to become a pagan Gentile, but it was grooming us and preparing us to realize that, that there is no one righteous. No one could ever be justified by the law. We need a Savior. We need a Messiah. We need Jesus Christ. That is really what Paul is building on to get us to that, that, that we might receive justification by faith. Verse 26 and this is, again, in the context of adoption. Keep in mind, it's in the context of adoption. He says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And what he's getting at, again, he's getting at being an heir of, with Abraham. Is Abraham is the father. 
we are, you know, is, is like our father. He has an inheritance. We are like, we are the children of Abraham, groomed by a child trainer. Now through Jesus Christ, we are, we are the sons of God, and now we're placed into the inheritance of Abraham. And so that's what, that's what Paul is getting at. Now go to verse 27. And, and again, uh, Paul is going to pick this back up in Galatians chapter 4, but now he goes in, in verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourselves in Christ, with Christ. Now, here, Paul, what he means when he's talking about baptism, he doesn't mean necessarily water baptism. Paul is talking about, I believe, what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, for by one spirit, we were, all made, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, whether we were, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. And so water, baptize, water baptism symbolizes that, but what Paul is talking about is when you were born again, when you were born of the Spirit, when the indwelling Holy Spirit came to live inside of you and he recreated you and he refashioned your human spirit and he made your spirit righteous and holy and complete and made you one with the Holy Spirit, when he did that, that work of raising your spirit from the dead, Paul is saying at the same time, the Spirit of God, the indwelling Spirit of God, baptized you into the body of Jesus Christ. See, who is part of the body of Jesus Christ? Well, it's not just if you're a, a, a church attender. Who is part of the body of Jesus Christ? It is those who have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have been baptized into Christ's body, and we have clothed ourselves with Christ. Now, in verse 28, and, and this verse of Scripture has meant a lot to me recently because, you know, we've got these, we, we've got just so many issues with racism have been raised up over the last few weeks in America with George Floyd and his murder. And I believe Paul tells us God's ultimate answer for racism, nationalism, genderism, any of the other isms we could think of. Paul tells us here is there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Jesus Christ. Man, do we need to hear that right now in America and around the world, really, is, is that there is not Jew or Gentile. There is not black or white in the body of Christ. There is not male or female. There is not any, any, any distinction in the body of Christ between race, nationality, or gender. You are all one in Jesus Christ. And so, you know, with George Floyd's murder, you know, racism, that this whole issue has been raised up and I believe God has his answer for all racism right here in Galatians chapter uh, 3, verse 28. And, and there, there's so many things I could say right now about it. But, you know, the one thing I will say is what I'm going to say here in a minute, I just want you to know that I wholeheartedly agree with Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, it may be that it may be true that the law cannot make a man love me but it can stop him from lynching me, and I think that's pretty important. So I am all for any forms of uh, law or social reform or justice that is legislated through uh, the legal system to help uh, establish equality and freedom and all that. I'm all for all of that. But here's what Galatians teaches us that we've got to know is that no external commandment can ever change the human heart. And ultimately, racism is not so much about the color of one's skin. Racism goes deep into the heart and tells us racism is about the color of our heart. Racism is a, the, the reflection of the pride in our heart. The pride that says, I am better than you are because of the color of my skin. And, and you, could, you could just take this in, in any of the isms, nationalism. I am better than you because I'm from America. I'm better than you because I'm white. I'm better than you because I am male or female or whatever. Any of the isms, that pride that is in our heart from Adam. And, and, and Paul's telling us that, that really that no external commandment can ever change the condition of the human heart. The Holy Spirit is the only ultimate solution to racism. Now, but again, I'm all for legal change. I'm all for laws. I'm all for regulation. I'm all for all of that to help establish full equality for all people. 
But here's what we got to understand. It is the Holy Spirit and only the Holy Spirit that can establish true unity. And, and I believe now the church, now more than ever, has an incredible opportunity to shine and to show the world this is what it looks like when a people of, of every tribe, tongue, people group, nation, gender, when, when a people come together and they say, we, there is no distinction in Jesus Christ, no class, no race, no nationality, none of that is going to divide us. We are one in the body of Jesus Christ. And I think we have an incredible opportunity right now to shine forth to the world to show this is what it looks like when racism comes to an end. And there is only one person in human history that can do that, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, just to give you a bit, a bit of an idea, if you think racism is bad in America, you should have seen what racism was like in the first century. Jew and Gentile hated each other. We, we don't even have an understanding of the racism between Jew and Gentile in the first century. See, because of the law, and Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2, because of the law, the Jews were separated from the Gentiles. And so the Jews uh, established this idea that Gentiles were uh, dogs, they were demonized, they were idol-worshiping pagans, and you know we can't get near them, we can't eat with them, because if we eat with them, we'll be defiled by them. And you know they, they established this entire idea that Gentiles were dogs, they were, just, they were, they were idol-worshiping, demon-worshiping people. Well, the Gentiles didn't appreciate that, and they looked at the Jews as holier-than-thou people, and they were, their mouth was watering throughout history to say, okay, whenever the Jews violate God's law, we are waiting to go so that we, the firewall of God's protection can come down so we can go and harass them, we can persecute them, we can conquer them, we can drive them out of the land. And you see that with Assyria, Babylon, Rome, Greece. You see that. And so, anyway, there was this incredible animosity, incredible division, incredible uh, separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. In fact, Peter, when we looked at this earlier, Peter, when he had the vision of the, of the sheet coming down out of heaven in Acts chapter 10, the Lord had to tell him basically three times, Peter, don't call unclean what I am now calling clean. In fact, the Lord even had to tell him, even after this incredible trance where he saw basically the, the gospel going to the Gentiles, the Lord had to tell him as he's going downstairs, there's Gentiles that are here to take you, where you, to, to, take you to minister to them. I want you to go without any misgivings. I mean, because it was so ingrained into the Jewish mindset of the first century that Gentiles were defiled, Gentiles were demonized, and there was a massive divide between them. And so here, I love what Paul is, is getting at here in Galatians, is that, is that the, the law, and he, he mentions this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, the law, which, and we saw this in the last session, the law, which set apart the Jews for, for hundreds of years until the Messiah came, keeping them distinct, not because God thought they were better than the Gentiles, but because God wanted to bring forth a remnant. God wanted to preserve a remnant. God wanted to sanctify a remnant so that he could bring forth the Messiah. And so the law served as a separation between Jew and Gentile so that the, the, there would be a remnant that could bring forth Messiah. And when he came, he nailed the law upon the cross, which was the source of division between Jew and Gentile. Paul talks about that. And he made the two, the two different groups, Jew and Gentile, into one. And, it, and here's the logic. If God could do that between Jew and Gentile, God can certainly do that in America between black and white. God can certainly do that in America between male and female. God can certainly do that in, in, in this nation and around the world, that there is no distinction, that the church of Jesus Christ is one, no matter what tribe or tongue or nationality or gender or whatever class or race or whatever it is that would divide, the isms that so often divide us from one another. 
Paul is telling us that you are all one in Jesus Christ. It's an interesting verse of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, it's just, I mean, it's so easy just to glance over it, but it fits in exactly with what we're looking at here in Galatians chapter 3. But Paul said, Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. It's incredible right there. You could, you could so easily just read over that and without even thinking about it. But based on this statement, the early Christians referred to themselves as the, as the third race. See, when I talk about the church of Jesus Christ, I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about an, an event. I'm not talking about a service. I'm not talking about, you know, hearing a message or, you know, see, receiving ministry or go, hearing music. I'm not talking about any of that. The church is the ecclesia. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. The church is made of every member of that body who has the life of Jesus Christ in them. That body is an entirely new creation. The body of Jesus Christ who has his spirit in them is an entirely new creation, a third race where there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, male and female. It's incredible that what God God's ultimate plan and answer for racism is through his body, by his spirit. I could say a ton more about that, but I need to move on or we'll never end here. So now in, in verse 29, Paul says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. And again, he's, he's bringing in the metaphor of first century adoption. The law is our tutor, leads us to justification in Jesus Christ. We, when we receive by faith, uh, when we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we are like the sons who are placed into the inheritance of Abraham. And we saw earlier that the blessing of Abraham is the indwelling Holy Spirit. So when, when, we put our, when the law leads us and trains us to justification by faith in Jesus Christ, where we are made righteous before we do anything, uh, uh, any kind of obedience, any kind of righteous deed, we are, made, we are made right with God simply by faith, we then are like the, the, the sons in the, in the adoption process who are placed into the father's inheritance, and Abraham being the father, Abraham having the inheritance, he, his inheritance is the indwelling Holy Spirit, we then receive the Holy Spirit by faith. And, and that's, what, that's what he's getting at. And that makes us heirs according to the promise. Now we get into Galatians chapter 4. And uh, Paul says, I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Now, I'm going to go through this pretty quick because for the sake of time. I've got a lot more detail in the notes if you want it. But the elemental things of the world were clearly the law, the, the, the shadows that pointed to the substance, which is Jesus Christ. The, the elemental things of the law, the feast and the Sabbath and all those different things pointed to the Messiah and Paul is saying to the Galatians, why do you want to go back under that stuff? Those things were just a child trainer. Those things were just preparing us for the Messiah, for justification by faith. Now, in, in verse 4, Paul says, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, woman born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We might be receive son placement. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And again, this is, this is the son being placed into the inheritance of Abraham and the, the inheritance being the indwelling Holy Spirit. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Our adoption is, is placement into Abraham's inheritance. So let me just summarize this before we move on from Galatians 3.23 to Galatians 4.7. Abraham is our father and he has an inheritance. His inheritance is justification by faith and the indwelling Holy Spirit. The law is our child trainer. The law is showing us our need for Jesus Christ, our need for justification. 
Before son placement, we were like children who don't differ from a slave. Even though we're owner of everything, even though the inheritance is reserved for us, we were like slaves in bondage, just like the child was in the first century and under the child trainer. But now that Jesus Christ has come, he has delivered us from the law. The law is no longer necessary because of Christ. The law is no longer necessary because of Christ. We have been placed as sons into Abraham's inheritance, meaning that we receive the blessing of the gospel. We receive the Messiah. We receive justification by faith. We receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. That, that's the, the idea that Paul is getting at here. Now we go on to uh, talk about enslaved by the law, uh, Galatians 4, 8 through 11. However, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. And, and so basically the, the Galatians were under an entire system of Greco-Roman idolatry where they worshipped idols. And behind these idols, there was this whole uh, system of religion. Behind the idols, there were demons. And so Paul was basically saying, these are not gods. These are just wooden and metal and, you know, whatever kind of material was made of statues that, that are supposed to represent some kind of God. But behind these gods are demons. You know, and Paul's telling the Galatians, before you came to Christ, you were worshiping demons. Before you came to Christ, you were worshiping idols. Verse 9, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you want to turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? What is he talking about? He's talking about the law. The Galatians, as we've seen throughout this entire book, the Galatians, the Judaizers are wanting to bring the Galatians back under the law, or not even back under the law, they were never under the law, the, the, the Judaizers wanted to bring the Galatians under the law. And Paul's like, you just got set free from idol worship. You just got set free from demons. And you've come to faith in Jesus Christ. Why do you want to go back to these elementary things? The law is just the shadows of Christ. And Christ is the substance of all of that. And you want to observe, verse 10, you want to observe days and months and seasons and years. And, and Paul was concerned. I'm, just, I'm really concerned about you. I'm concerned that I have labored in vain over you. And so Paul, as the spiritual father, was, was burdened and gripped by that. And so he goes on, and starting in verse 12, Paul recounted his first trip with them, and he, he says, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also become as you are. You have done me no wrong, and you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Verse 15, where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you, have, you would have plucked out your eye and given it to me. And so a lot of people here think that Paul, when he, when he ministered in Galatia the first time, when he was sick, when he had a bodily condition, a lot of people believe, and I, I believe it's true, he had some type of eye condition that was just made it, I know, just was an eye-type condition that looked unappealing and it was affecting him. But the Galatians looked at him and said, hey, if we could pluck our eye out and help you, we would do that. We love you. We were, you're like an angel to us. You're almost like Jesus Christ himself. And so Paul's like, okay, I don't understand, guys. When I first came to you, it was incredible. We were one, and you received me like an angel. You received me like the Messiah. You would have even taken your eye and given it to me. I mean, it was an incredible time we had together. The Spirit of God was moving, and all of a sudden now, things are a little different. I don't, I'm perplexed by that. Why do you want to go back under the law? In fact, in, starting in, in verse 16, Paul is talking, and, he, and he's saying, okay, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? I'm telling you guys, I'm telling you, don't go back, un don't go under the law. It is your death sentence. You will never, ever be right with God. It is your death sentence. Am I your enemy now because I'm telling you the truth? Am I your enemy because I'm speaking the truth to you in love? Verse 17, 
He's talking about the Judaizers. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. Wow. Paul's telling us the Judaizers are masquerading as being these people who are just so holy and so, so righteous and all these, they've, they've done everything blamelessly what the law says, but inwardly Paul's pointing out what they want, Galatians, is they want to be your spiritual overlord. They want to be over you. They want you to seek them. He says in verse 18, but it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner and not only when I am present with you. And so the ultimate motive of the Judaizers was they wanted the Galatians to seek them. They wanted to be their spiritual overlord. They wanted to be their master spiritually, and they wanted to do that by having them get circumcised and obey the law. But here Paul is going to show us his heart, and it's beautiful. He says in verse 19, my children... See, Paul is a father. He doesn't want to be a spiritual overlord. He is their father. My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. This is a beautiful scripture. Paul is showing us what all true leadership in the body of Christ should look like. As we are, the, we are spiritual fathers to the spiritual children. And our goal in labor whether that's labor through preaching or writing or evangelism or discipleship or intercession, our goal in this labor is we want to see Jesus Christ formed in them. That is, that is the ultimate intention. That is God's ultimate plan is to have a group of people, the body of Jesus Christ, that have the indwelling life, that have the indwelling life of the Son in their spirit, to have that life worked out, to have their heart formed and filled with Christ, to have their minds and wills and emotions formed into the image of Christ, to have their bodies reflect the, the nature and the character and the actions of Jesus Christ. Paul was in labor saying, you are my children. I am your father. I am not coming to be your overlord. I am not coming to put you under me. I am a spiritual father to you. There's many teachers, there's many people who are teachers around the world, there's many people who are teachers, but I haven't come to be your teacher, I've come to be your father, you are my spiritual children, and I am laboring for you, I am working for you, so that God's ultimate intention to conform you into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ, Romans 8.28, I believe, or 8.29, is to conform us into the image of his Son, and that's what Paul was doing. That's what Paul was, was laboring for. Verse 20, he said, I, I wish, it's actually Romans 8, 29, but I wish to be present with you now to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Finally, Paul is admitting what we picked up on in the very first sentence of Galatians. He has a certain tone about him. He's perplexed. He's frustrated. He, you know, it's just like if you have kids and they're doing something that is foolish and you look at them like you're, you're, you're as parents and you say, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Why did you do this? What did you do? Why did you do that? And Paul's like, my children, why? I, I can't even comprehend. <laughs> why do you want, having been set free from the law, why do you want to go back under it? You know, the law for for however many years, for centuries, has been leading us to the Messiah. The Messiah has come. He's resurrected. His spirit has been poured out. And now you want to go back under the law? It's like, I'm perplexed. I'm frustrated. And he gives another analogy here in verse 21. He's, he's asking, he's basically asking, do you want bondage or freedom? And so he's just continuing to drill into the Galatians angle after angle, you know, line upon line, teaching them and saying to them, why do you want, why do you want to go under the law? And he tells me in verse 21, tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. 
Verse 23, but the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. Verse 24, this is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one that proceeds from Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. And verse 25, but this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. And then verse 26, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. And so let me just summarize this here for us. Is Hagar... You know, going all the way back to Genesis chapter, I forget the exact, ref, the exact Genesis 15, 16, somewhere in there. Hagar is the mother of those who are under the law. She symbolizes Mount Sinai in Arabia. She is the mother of the old covenant. She is the present Jerusalem with her children who are in slavery. Ishmael, born according to the flesh, is a picture of... Of the, of the Jewish people in Jerusalem still trying to be justified by the law. And Paul says, but Sarah, she is the Jerusalem from above. She is our mother. She pictures the Jerusalem from above who is our mother. She pictures the new covenant. Isaac pictures those Jew and Gentile born of the Holy Spirit, born through, reborn through justification by faith, she pictures Isaac and the, the child by promise. And he says, okay, uh, you know, he's like, which one do you want to be? Do you want to be in bondage? Do you want to be in la- and under in shackles, in chains? Or do you want to be set free and be like Isaac? Paul mentioned specifically the Jerusalem above, which is our mother. And uh, he's re- that's referencing the new Jerusalem. And, and basically, there, there's way too much revelation to go into that right now. But you could look at Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, Revelation 21 and, and 22. And, and you can see just a snapshot of, of what Paul's talking about. The new city Jerusalem, our mother, our mother from above, giving birth to this, the uh, stars of heaven, like God told Abraham, uh, the spiritual descendants of Abraham, Jew and Gentile. And he goes on here in verse 27. And he's he's going to quote Isaiah 54. And he says, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. And I've, I've done a study here of linking what Paul's talking about, the heavenly Jerusalem, Isaiah chapter 54, the new Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem, the natural and spiritual sons of Abraham, and how at the end of the age when Christ returns in the millennial kingdom, how all of that will be brought together. It is an incredible study, way, way too much to go into right now. But if you ever are interested, just study that, Isaiah 54, and this passage in Galatians, uh, Revelation 21 through 22. All that God is going to do in giving birth to, through the barren one, the, 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 that rejoice, O barren one, that there is a Sarah. There is a, the heavenly Jerusalem is a Sarah who is giving birth to children that are spiritual, too numerous to count because Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross. The grain of wheat fell into the ground and died and produced a harvest of sons. It's an incredible, deep, deep revelation there. But uh, we need to move on. Now we're in verse 28. And he, Paul says, And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But at that time, he who was born according to the flesh, talking about Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So it is now. And Paul is saying, Okay, guys, listen. The Judaizers who want you to be circumcised, the Judaizers that want to place you under the law, they, they, they are just like Ishmael was to Isaac. They're persecuting you. They, I, Ishmael persecuted Isaac back then. The Judaizers are persecuting you now. And, and, and so he, his logic is, okay, listen, legalism and dead religion And the traditions of men have no inheritance with the children of promise born of the Holy Spirit. The two cannot coexist. They cannot be together. They are incompatible. 
And his logic here in verse 30 and 31, he says, what does the scripture say? He says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman will not be heir with the son of the free woman. Free woman. Verse 31, so then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but we are children of a free woman. And so Paul is telling us, guys, here's the logic. Ishmael and Isaac could not coexist. So it is today, the Judaizers wanting to bring you under the law, you cannot coexist with those born of the Spirit. If you want to be under the law, you cannot have any part of Jesus Christ. You cannot have any part of the Holy Spirit. You are on your own if you want to seek justification by the law. He says, the only solution is to, like, like it was in the days of Abraham, as hard as that was, and Abraham loved Ishmael. Abraham loved Ishmael. It was the only thing he could do. He had to cast out the bondwoman and her son. His religion and legalism has no place of the, for, in the lives of those born of the Spirit. You could say it in your own life. That, that in any place in your heart where there is legalistic tendencies, God would say, cast out that bondwoman and her son. Cast out that religion. Cast out that legalism. Cast out that seeking to be justified. Cast out that self-righteous determination to be right with God and to please Him by how well you obey Him. Cast that out. It has no place in those who are led by the Spirit. It has no place in those who are led by and living by the Holy Spirit. Cast it out. It has no place. It could be said in churches. There's churches where people want to bring back people under the law and bring back people to say, if you don't do this, if you don't pray enough, if you don't fast enough, if you don't read the Scriptures enough, then you really can't be right with God. You can't be on the cutting edge. This whole idea that you've got to do, do, do for God to be accepted by Him or to be holy. Holiness comes by our obedience and the response of the, the Spirit of God living in us and our yieldedness to Him. And, and even in churches, they're, they're, you know, the churches can be divided over legalistic tendencies and religion and those that want to go on just being led by the Holy Spirit. God would say, you got to cast out the bondwoman and her son. That there is no place, there can be no mixture between legalism, no mixture between legalism and dead religion and the, the fresh move of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to bring, we're going to bring uh, session Galatians chapter 4 here to a close. There is a, a mouthful. <laughs> There is a tremendous amount that I went through, and I went through it pretty fast. Um, you, you, you can get, if you want to just, and I know it's just almost like a fire hose just coming down at you, but if you want to go deep in this, just get the notes. The notes go line by line. Detail, there's a lot more detail in the notes, and, and just really seek to understand it. So anyway, we'll bring session four now to a close.